Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Anne Koch, and I'm the Program Director at the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Uh, and today I'm going to be the moderator of the session. It's very gratifying to be part of the Misinformation and Medicine Summit. And I want to thank Data Leads and Syed Nazakat for inviting us and the new Google News Initiative for hosting the summit. So hello, everyone who's joined us from the summit, from this webinar, and also others from around the world. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on journalism um, and specifically on strategies and tips for improving journalism on medical issues. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced many journalists to become healthcare experts overnight, which, of course, is no easy task and their job already difficult because of the expertise required, the specialist knowledge required, has been made even more difficult by the absolute mountains of contested data uh, and claims, and also by the very profound disagreements among scientists and medical professionals, not to speak of politicians. Uh, in addition, there's been a, a tsunami of disinformation, uh, and I'm sure people who've joined this webinar are familiar with this context. So although this issue has very much come to the fore during the pandemic, the need for both accurate reporting and investigation in uh, health and medicine is not something that's new to the pandemic. Uh, we at GIGN decided to try and help. And at this summit, we're very pleased to be launching a really major new guide into investigating healthcare. Uh, and we'll be talking about the guide in this session. So we'll put a link into the uh, chat box now so you can see the guide. More important than that, we've got the two brilliant authors of this guide here today joining me. Uh, and I'd now like to introduce them. Serena Chinari and Catherine Riva are medical investigative jour journalists and co-founders of an organization called ReCheck. It's a Swiss nonprofit dedicated to investigating and mapping health affairs. Uh, ReCheck produces multi-language publications, supports newsrooms on their health investigations, and gives training workshops. Uh, and we'll put a link to ReCheck in the chat box as well. And also finally, another piece of information in the uh, in the chat box, further biographical information about both Serena and Catherine, who individually have co-authored important investigative stories about drug safety, conflicts of interest, uh, and a range of medical programs. So uh, Serena and Catherine um, will make a presentation about the new guide and focus on one case study. Uh, they'll speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions. Um, the last thing I want to say is just a little information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, we are the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations with 203 member organizations in 80 countries, but we work with everyone in the journalists everywhere in the commercial sector, nonprofit, and freelancers. And we have a, an extensive range of resources, including, of, as of now, this great new health guide. Um, so look, check our resources out at GIGN.org. And when we come to audience questions, please put them in the Q&A box. You'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And my colleague Eunice Ah oh, will join us to moderate the questions. So without further ado, let's start over to Serena and Catherine. And don't forget to unmute. Thank you. OK, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Anne. It's really a big pleasure for us to be here at this important summit. So I'm going to start our presentation and we will be very happy to get your questions if you have any at the end of the presentation. So let's start with our big baby. This is the cover of the Investigating Health and Medicine GIJN guide. It was really a big pleasure and honor for us to write it. And as you can see, um, I mean, I will now try to guide you a little bit to the guide, and then we will show you how to use the guide for a specific case. So it's a, it's a case study. So the guide, uh, what is the background? Uh, this is a very complex field of journalism. And this uh, is a field that you can't possibly improvise. The learning curve is quite steep. 
But what happened uh, in 2020, actually, uh, most journalists overnight, as Anne said, had to start being medical reporters. And this is not something you can actually do without risking so many pitfalls. Um, investigating health and healthcare is complex and challenging because reporting in this field means reading lengthy documents and getting really familiar also with some medical jargon. You need to be comfortable with numbers, with statistics. So it's, it's quite difficult. And here at warp speed, everyone had to start improvising being a medical reporter. So the guide in this way is, is pretty timely, we think, and we really hope that we, it will help uh, journalists doing uh, better journalism in this field, because it's very important for the public interest. So here you see the table of contents. Uh, the guide has been designed this way, that you can actually read it as a handbook, or you can jump from one chapter to the next if you need it. So anytime you need to report about something specific, you can look in the table of contents and jump to the chapter that you actually need. So we have also uh, an introduction about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where we give some tips, we give some resources. Uh, also, you see here on the right of your screen, uh, we point at three uh, pieces that are really important. We suggest you to read them. They are from really good colleagues, like good medical investigative reporters and experts. And they give you really a bit some, some important tips also about pitfalls you want to avoid in your pandemic journalism. Then um, we put together some tips or like advice pieces, right? So if you are going to report about COVID-19, really stay away from oversimplification. It's not a good friend for you. Be very cautious about the models. Models should come always with a warning. We speak at length about this in the guide and uh, you can read it yourself. This is very important for us. Stick to the best available scientific evidence. Uh, at ReCheck, we work with the evidence-based medicine framework. We believe that evidence-based medicine and investigative journalism, they really share a thinking, which is really sticking to the best evidence, questioning every information you get. And there's also a lot about what we don't know. So there is also some systematic approach that the two share. Provide context, please. Uh, never one metric. For us, this is extremely important. If you report about something, let's say ICU occupancy rate, please go and check first what is normal in your country. In a normal season, how many free ICU beds your local hospital has? And then you can go and check what is going on now. And also, for instance, uh, we hear a lot about uh, viral pneumonia caused by uh, this virus. What is happening with normal, normally with other kinds of viral pneumonias? All this is very important. Provide context. And please don't fall for the hype, because as we know worldwide, uh, there is a lot of hype at the moment. And this is never a good friend for an investigative journalist. Uh, so the guide comes also with uh, plenty of resources. We have about 500 links into the guide. So you will find a lot of examples too. And then we have these three appendixes. So you have like a glossary of terms because we try to, wrote, to write it in a plain language, but of course there is some jargon. Then you have a list of regulatory agencies and books. Uh, we really suggest you to check the books listing because they are really some really good, good stuff, good reads. So this is our case study for today. What we are going to do today, we are going to show you how you can use the guide and the way you can use evidence-based medicine approach 
to deconstruct a new story. So this was the biggest news uh, last week worldwide. Uh, there was actually a press release of Pfizer uh, about their vaccine. So we see that the headlines were kind of the same. These headlines are about the first press release because there were two press releases published within a few days. And actually between the first and the second press release, the um, efficacy of this vaccine went from 90 to 95%. So the headlines were kind all the same. Early data show uh, vaccines more than 90% effective. Uh, these headlines, as you can see, they were like uh, very clear, right? Like this is a fact. So what was behind this uh, story um, was a press release. Uh, very quickly, this you find in the guide, these are the normal stages of approval of a drug or a vaccine. So as you can see, uh, there are many stages and it takes quite some time. But now during this pandemic, uh, everything is going following the fast track. At page 18 of the guide, you will find more information about what fast track is. In a nutshell, it means accelerating approval by reducing the amount and the quality of the evidence that the industry must submit. This was um, invented, the fast track, for a novel, with a novel purpose to quickly bring new treatments to patients that would address unmet needs. However, we know that in recent years, the fast track became also a shortcut for pharmaceutical companies because it allows them to skip or shorten in-depth assessment by the regulators. This is the second press release, um, and we will go a bit into more details. Uh, just these were like the bullet points. So we are talking about uh, primary efficacy analysis that demonstrates, that's what the press release reads, this vaccine to be 95% effective, okay? And then we have a bunch of many more, much more information. We leave it there for the moment. Uh, what is important to notice here that really this is just a press release. And I think we all agree a press release is not a scientific study, right? So now I over to you, Catherine, and we will go a bit into more details. Yes, uh, we do, because this press release included some very interesting statements. So we have, for example, uh, that the observed efficacy in adults over 65 years of age was over 94%. Uh, the safety data was suggesting that the vaccine was well tolerated by participants. Um, and that trial data should soon be shared with regulatory agencies around the world. Um, uh, but it comes with a but because um, the efficacy data presented in this press release, they are only those of 170 participants and the whole trial included 43,000 participants. In other world, um, uh, the full trial data have yet to be peer-reviewed and published. And as explained in the guide, a good idea for investigative reporters is to use PICO. Uh, PICO is a, a tool uh, that allows doctors to conduct targeted searches in the medical literature. Uh, the underlying idea of PICO is that any clinical question can be broken down in four dimensions. The P comes for a patient. In our case, um, uh, it comes down to the question of who are the patients included in the Pfizer and BioNTech trial. The I comes for intervention. Here, obviously, the intervention is the vaccine. Uh, the C comes for comparator. 
in, uh, you need to know what the vaccine has been compared with, uh, and O comes for outcome. Uh, in our case, the criteria against which the efficacy of the vaccine was assessed. And using this tool allows to ask the four fundamental questions you need to answer in order to see if a study is addressing the questions that are relevant to patients or to the population. A novelty of the COVID era is that pharmaceutical companies are providing access to their study protocol uh, in plain language, it was a black screen, and in the full form, as you see here, this is the Pfizer protocols. And as we explain in the guide, uh, the study protocols are extremely important uh, because, and that's why we strongly encourage journalists to read these documents before publishing their article. And we encourage them to try to find there the answers to the four PICO questions. So let's use the study protocol to answer the four PICO questions. Population. Uh, here, it means the trial participants. In the protocol, we can see that the participants were healthy males and females older than, uh, than, 12, than 12 years. The investigators established also some type of people that should be considered in their opinion as at higher than average risk for COVID-19 infection. Here, for example, uh, they use mass transportation, uh, they are employees as frontline essential workers, and so on. The intervention is this vaccine with the, these weird numbers. Uh, the comparator is a saline placebo, it means salt water. And the outcome, uh, uh, it means here, what is the primary endpoint of the trial? The primary endpoint is what the trial wants to measure. And here, the primary endpoint is labeled COVID-19 disease. So with the information of the protocol, we can answer our PICO questions, but this answer, let us see clearly that there are actually more questions. So let's look at them together. Here are some of the questions. The press release states that the observed efficacy in adults over 65 years of age was over 94%. But how many of the 170 cases of COVID-19 were over 65 years of age? Obviously, we will have to wait for the publication because nothing in the press release nor in the resources made available allows us to answer this question. The press release only states that 41% of global and 45% of US participants are 56 to 85 years of age, but we don't know how big this proportion was in the 170 cases. If there are only a few cases, it would be quite premature to draw conclusions about the vaccine's efficacy for all the 43,000 participants. The press release mentioned also numbers of cases of COVID-19 and of severe cases of COVID-19. And here we have another very important question. What counts actually as a COVID and as a case of severe COVID-19? So let's have a closer look at this important question. What do the investigators consider to be a confirmed COVID-19 or a severe COVID-19? This is fundamental because there is a great deal of uncertainty on it. As explained by Carl Hennigan and Tom Jefferson of the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at University of Oxford, depending on the country and the region, what is considered a COVID case can vary considerably. Uh, so does a positive test count as a confirmed COVID? Are other symptoms taken into account? We must also ask what is more important from a public health point of view, that people do not cough, that they do not have a fever, or rather that they are not hospitalized, that they are not intubated, or that they don't die. 
In the study protocol, we see that what is considered as a confirmed COVID case is whether what we would describe as a mild case. Um, the definition of uh, severe COVID, on the other hand, describes whether what one would like a vaccine to avoid, both for, for the, the health of individuals and for the burden on the healthcare system, because we see here what the patients show as signs, as symptoms, they are really severe, they are life-threatening. But unfortunately, severe COVID-19 is not among the endpoints set for this trial, as we can see from the study protocol. We can see in the study protocol this phrase, uh, it means in other words, that the goal of the trial is to show whether the vaccine can prevent a positive test with at least one relatively mild symptom in uninfected patients and possibly in patients who have already been infected. And this, uh, that comes in the second sentence, uh, and this seven days after the second dose of the vaccine and possibly 14 days after the second dose on the vaccine. That's the goal of the trial, that and nothing more. Other analyses will be certainly conducted in the future on this data, but they will be exploratory analyses. And by definition, exploratory analyses do not allow strong claims. We have more questions. <laughs> the press release also states that safety data suggest that the vaccine was well tolerated by participants. So this is a question about safety. What do these numbers mean here? The 2% frequency, 3.8% headache at 2.0%. Uh, and how was safety uh, assessed? So pay attention because in the press release, in the lead, we, we miss an important information. The safety data are not those of the 43,000 participants, but those of a subset of 8,000 participants. This is only 20% of the total number of participants. So we will still need the safety data of 35,000 participants before we can make any claim about safety. And we strongly encourage journalists to read the disclaimer because the disclaimer reminds us that these are interim results, that the study's conclusions could change. And so in this perspective, we have to be very, very cautious because the numbers communicated by Pfizer and BioNTech seem encouraging, no doubt, but Every claim should be considered very carefully because of the numerous limitation. And now over to you, Serena. So um, we decided to show you this and we try now to show you a bit, how can you use the guide to do exactly this kind of work? So we just talked about safety and I think we all agree that safety is a key component for any drug, any vaccine, and this is extremely important here. We also know that actually vaccines, normally they have to be especially safe because vaccines are going to be given actually to, by definition, to healthy individuals. So in the world of drug safety and vaccine safety, we say that if I give something to a healthy individual, it must be especially safe. So in the guide, uh, especially around page 59, you can dig a bit deeper in what is the mechanism that we have in place worldwide to assess the safety and also monitor safety. Uh, and you will find quite a lot of information on how this is done. Another point that we suggest you right now, we are talking about vaccines and drugs uh, for this very special situation the whole planet uh, finds itself in. Uh, never forget that a study is not just a study. 
uh, there are major differences in design. And as Catherine showed you, it's super important that you go to the real raw data. So you go to the study protocol, you go and see how was the study designed and what for kind of a study is this? Because we know that actually, uh, as someone put it in a very beautiful book, we, we suggest you to read how to lie with statistics, is that actually statistics can pull out of the bag almost anything that may be wanted. And this is something that uh, any medical investigative journalist will tell you that is one of the biggest struggle we have in this field, because we can't just trust any government or industry press release or presser or an expert uh, statement. You need to do your own homework. So you need to go really to the, to the ground of it and study. This is something we think is very important, generally speaking, and very much in this situation, because actually the dominant narrative in 2020 suggests that the world is facing a new and unprecedented medical emergencies. But actually, Lessons have been learned from hundreds of years of medicine, healthcare, epidemiology, uh, infectious diseases management. Uh, we think today, probably in this audience of this amazing summit, there are probably med many medical doctors. Uh, you know exactly what we are speaking about, right? So we suggest that journalists uh, willing to cover or having to cover this COVID-19 situation, they need, first of all, to get to know more about routines and protocols in healthcare. How is it the normal? How is it the standard? And then from there, you can assess what is really diff different this time. Also, we believe learn from the past means also to go and see what happened before. So in this case, as we are talking uh, mainly about safety of a, of a vaccine, uh, there is a very important case that no medical investigative reporter and uh, vaccine safety specialist will ever forget. Uh, 10 years ago, H1N1, swine flu, uh, there was this vaccine, um, Pandemrix, that actually, um, was supposed to be safe and effective, but unfortunately it was harmful for kids. So we know, but it took a long time. The, as you can see in this slide, I mean, this is a really long story. We are cutting a really long story short, but this is a brilliant case because it shows you that sometimes we need time to really assess the safety of a new product. That's why we have to be extremely cautious and stick to the best available methodology. As you can see here, and you can of course research and read more about this story, it took almost 10 years until we really could realize what had happened. And meanwhile, there were many kids and some young adults that actually had some um, important damage to their health. So let's keep in mind this, and that's why we are all really looking forward to have a great vaccine or a great drug here. I mean, no doubt about this, but we are also very cautious. And the press release, unfortunately, is not enough to draw any conclusion, actually, on safety and efficacy of any given product. So um, we are almost there. So this is an article that uh, a brilliant GI the GIJN team member wrote to launch the guide. Here we have like 10 tips um, and they apply quite a lot to the COVID-19 situation. So beware of oversimplification. I mean, we know it's difficult because I mean, as a journalist, you are supposed to not speak a, a language full of medical jargon because otherwise people might actually not really understand. But you have to watch out because when you oversimplify science and medicine, the chance that you misrepresent reality is pretty big. So the, the, the headline of this summit is misinformation in medicine. 
we are speaking here maybe also about misinformation in journalism. Be very cautious about the models. Uh, first of all, the models, um, the first models were developed uh, at a time in the very beginning, at the very beginning of this story, where we didn't really have good data. And obviously, models um, are good uh, if the data that feed them is also good, the data set. And when they started, actually, we didn't have really good data. So we have been seeing like uh, incredible models, uh, rather often, luckily, they were proven to be wrong, faulty. So be very careful if you want to use in your journalism models. And if you give the floor to an expert trying to tell you what will happen in the future, that's very difficult. In the guide, we point at some good articles you can read about this. Stick to the best available evidence, scientific evidence. Go really to the ground and look for the best, most solid methodology, because there are really big difference. If you take observational data, for instance, the level of evidence won't be that strong. So be very careful with this. Provide context, as we said already before, uh, you need always to put things in a context. Uh, a number by itself doesn't mean much. Uh, human brains, we need always a so-called denominator. If I tell you 10, doesn't mean anything. If I tell you 10, uh, out of 100, we have 10, it starts to be different, right? So we need context. We need a, a framework, a perspective. Then uh, point five is like about the, the experts. We have like a tsunami of experts speaking on the media since months now. They are not all the same. One example could be uh, we are both uh, senior journalists, but we are not sport journalists. So if you would interview me about something related to sport journalism, I would probably give you information that is pretty flowed. If you want to interview me about science and medical reporting, maybe I can tell you a few things. So it's the same with scientists. It's not enough to be a scientist, to be an expert on infectious diseases management. Don't fall for the hype. We have been speaking already about this. Uh, understand clinical trials, the different stages, and what the results mean or do not mean. We, point eight is a bit complex, but question the bad guy narrative. Reality in this field is way more complicated. We don't have one bad guy, it's a system that has many, many angles. And in the guide, we have quite some, many pages about this to try and help you to put things in a context. Uh, question the big players. Uh, because, of course, the big players, they have quite a lot at stake. But remember, the most important thing is public health, is the public, is the public interest. And hunt for the red flags. Because if you feel somehow that something is a bit off, well, dig deeper. So the press release is, is a typical example. A press release is just a press release. So the headlines, maybe were not exactly accurate because some people could think that the source was a study. No, it was just a press release. This is again our table of contents. And again, uh, we really hope this guide can be useful for medical journalists, for journalists, generally speaking, but maybe also for students, but also for the general public. A lot of effort was put in trying to write this guide in a jargon-free language so that everyone can read it and use it as you please. You can use it like read it once from the first page to the last, or you just jump where you find like, well, I need to know more about uh, trials. I want to know more about conflicts of interest. So you just jump into that chapter. So uh, over to you, Anne. Okay, thank you very much. I can say def most definitely that this guide can be read by non-experts 
who can learn a lot from it. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about this, I have to say. And although I, I'm not a science journalist or a medical journalist and couldn't be one yet, I would say this has been just created so many new avenues and questions uh, in in the way we think about the pandemic at the moment and many other things. Uh, please don't be intimidated by it. It's absolutely clear and really, really helpful. Um, it's actually quite inspiring. Um, I'm going to ask Eunice to join us because there's been some questions from the audience and there's still time if you want to ask, other people want to ask questions, by all means do. But I just wanted to start with one on, of my own, um, which is about the press release that we spoke about, the Pfizer press release and the, the, the number of people in the trial. Um, the, 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 could you explain what now will happen just so we can, in a sense, finish the story? So some information has been released and what is likely to happen now with the whole um, release? That's, and I have one other question, then I'll go to Eunice. Yeah. Now, uh, I think this today night came a press release from the Food and Drug Administration. And they say the uh, vaccine committee, the VRPBSC will now have a session. That's a novum uh, also in this crisis. Um, uh, in the early days, it was always possible to uh, find the minutes of the meetings of the VRPBSC uh, when uh, they discussed the approvals, you could see the background documents and so on. But now it will be live broadcasted on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. So the public has the possibility to watch it live. Uh, that's new. Um, I don't know, it's, it's an effort in transparency. I think the main issues here are still uh, that the, there is a very accelerated approval. It's so, so short. You saw on the graphic, uh, usually you need 20 years to, uh, to bring uh, a vaccine to the market from the phase one, uh, from the preclinical pre phase with uh, animal testing and so on until it's marketed. But, and now we are doing it in six months. So uh, it's, uh, it's a very delicate, uh, delicate issue. Uh, of course, it's, I think it's a very good thing that uh, and the public will have the possibility to ask questions before the meeting uh, uh, will be held. And that's, that's a very good thing as well. We still don't know how they will bring this question in the discussions that's still open. Uh, but I think generally it's very, for the inter interested public, it's, very, it's a very nice opportunity to see how the experts work, how they discuss issues, and, uh, and how, we, how they will uh, uh, prioritize some aspects and less others. Uh, I think it's, yes, it's, it's a challenging time. Yes. Yeah. Maybe can be also said that it's clear, right, that there is a lot of pressure. There is pressure on the regulators. Um, there is a lot of uh, polarization. There is a lot of politics in this story, right? Mm. And there is also a lot of money. Uh, a press release like the one we, we had a look at it at together, uh, it has a, a major consequences, of course, because media reporting like not everyone uh, is able to go and search for the protocol of a study. So what happens then is that everything is starting to spin and move very fast. And this is, of course, for people like us is a bit concerning because, I mean, we want, of course, to have safe and effective drugs yes. and vaccines. We all want that. It's just that normally there is not by chance, there is a very lengthy and complex process to get there. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's very difficult to make sound science in such a hurry. It's, it's extremely difficult. So uh, they have to cut some corners and, um, and, and it's, yes, we have to really to watch it. That was exactly what I was thinking, how this, it's not over yet and there's a lot to watch. I just want to ask one last question before I turn to Eunice, which is, you know, um, a lot of this is indeed about protocols, accuracy, PICO, methodology. Um, but I, there is there is a huge potential to, when you understand some of these um, detailed methodological issues and red flags and how to look at them, where you can actually get more stories 
I'm not talking only about COVID-19, I'm talking about uh, the whole sector of health and medicine. And could you say a little bit more about how you can be creative to find new investigative stories? Because of course, that's what we want more of as well. Lots of more stories in this area. Well, in our experience, um, that's also the very fascinating thing about this field, like many other fields, that you never run out of story, of stories. Like, when you start like being a bit familiar, knowledgeable about this field, you're going to really see the red flags. And it's like cherry, like one after the next, and you never run out of stories. And they are really very compelling because I mean, I think we all agree that health care and medicine and public health is really universal and is really global. So you can always find a, a more local angle because maybe your editor will ask you, hey, do you have a Swiss patient? Do you have a Swiss doctor? In my case, I'm based in Switzerland, but actually healthcare is really global. So it's also a field where you can also mm, collaborate with colleagues from other countries. And that's also what we, we like doing. Yes, and, and generally, the, the, I think the fitting between uh, evidence-based medicine and uh, investigative journalism, it's, it's really a, a brilliant training for your critical thinking. And uh, I mean, if you're uh, well-trained in this era, you will find new teams. You will see something is not accurate. It's not going the proper way. And that's something you have to investigate because that's the purpose of investigative journalism. And uh, I think this critical thinking helps you to see all these blind spots that need to be investigated. And maybe one last thing on this uh, question is that we know that sometimes it's a bit scary because we give presentations, we give training, right? And sometimes we warn our students, don't be scared. Now comes the scary side. <laughs> Because it's true that sometimes you can really feel like, I can't do that. You can, because we both did it. And it's not that we are like super intelligent people. We are just really normal investigative journalists. The only thing, and there I won't lie to you, uh, you need to invest some time. You need to learn the basics. You need to um, learn, be confident a bit with the methodology. So that's why the guide, the guide, we hope is also a little bit of a shortcut for you, everyone that have want to find time or are curious and want to read it, because we really try to break it down in a more simple way to guide you, to, to help you, to share with you the knowledge we, we accumulated. So it's a process, but you can do it. I mean, don't be afraid. It's possible. Great. Thanks, Eunice. Let's go to some questions, please, from the audience. Hi, everyone. Yes, um, the first question, uh, well, I guess Serena and Catherine has already addressed that. Uh, someone asked whether journalists with a life sciences or medical education background can cover the crisis and related issues more critically. Mm, it's, it's difficult <laughs> because um, I think... Uh, on one part, uh, you're in advantage, that's true, if you have a medical or a science background, because uh, you're familiar with some terms, you are familiar with some statistics and so on. But um, what we often see in, by, when we train journalists who have such a background, they are overconfident in what uh, you would describe the uh, physiopathology. It means, uh, okay, uh, this uh, protein should trigger, uh, trigger this reaction and so on. And uh, they think if I read, uh, I don't know, a press release uh, from a research center where they say, yes, now we have something we, uh, which is very promising because it triggered that, pro that protein and so on. Uh, they think, okay, it sounds logical for me. So I think uh, they don't lie when they say, okay, we can cure cancer or we can cure Alzheimer with such a, uh, with such a thing. And they forget about the critical thinking we just addressed because uh, they say, what do we have as a study? If you, we have only studies on cells or on animals, it's much, much, much too early to draw such conclusion. So I think it's an advantage on one side, but it can be, it can lead you to some pitfalls uh, on the other hand. Yeah. Okay, and uh, my second question from the audience, who controls the narrative and 
benefits most in this pandemic in the medical industry? So what do investigative journalists need to pay the most attention to in terms of these players? Well, um, maybe oh, I think one uh, recurrent problem in pandemic journalism, as we are calling it recently, Catherine and I, we call it this way, pandemic journalism. Uh, the biggest problem is actually copy pasting or anyway, uh, without critical assessment, what your government says, that's not okay. Uh, government, um, experts, um, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, you name it, every actor has its own agenda. So the weird thing that is happening that for us is a bit really confusing is that normally, mostly investigative journalists, we do not copy paste government press releases, right? It's the other way around. Normally we uh, follow the presser and we look for the blind spots and we think, ah, oh, wait a minute, why the guy said that? That's what we do normally. In this emergency situation, suddenly, uh, governments are the good guys, uh, industry, they are great, everyone is great. And that's actually is a flawed narrative because of course, I mean, public health communication is a super difficult thing. So uh, I also feel for them sometimes when I look at the presser, I think, wow, because we know it's really hard to explain what is going on, not use too much jargon, but still we need to question everything. You can't just copy paste uh, what but, they say. But we are aware it's a very difficult task because there are so much players involved now. They, they have so much players who try to uh, really to take, to take it all. <laughs> and uh, because there is so much money and so much power uh, at stake. Uh, and so, and we saw uh, new players coming, you know, uh, nobody talked about, uh, I don't know, digital epidemiology uh, two years ago, and now it's a very big thing. Uh, we have a big issue with the big data players as well. We, we, we don't have just the testing and the pharmaceutical industry. We have other players who emerged in, the, in this crisis, uh, but we think uh, uh, it's very important uh, that the journalists start really to ask the narrative, to, to do just this basic work we, we made here during this presentation with the press release. Uh, it doesn't take uh, time, but the article you will write after you made this breakdown, it will be completely different as just the copy paste, you know, of the lead of the press release. And uh, we think that's, that's the basic. If uh, mass media try to make this effort, I think we might have under uh, other perspectives now on, on the events and it would be really needed. And maybe as we are talking here about uh, players, um, one quite interesting angle probably now, it's also what about the hospitals? Yeah. Because I mean, we are reading worldwide headlines like we don't, I mean, we try to not overwhelm them. Oh my God, ICU beds, are there enough? Uh, there again, this, for instance, is a is a is an input for an investigation. Everyone can do in in any country. What is normal with ICU beds? How many are occupied in a normal winter without a pandemic? Let's put it this way. And also, who's paying for that? Because, like in the different health systems, the countries are different, of course. Um, the financial part of the story is also very important where they cut to the healthcare budgets in their last years in your country. I mean, there you have so many stories you can dig out. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's another question, which kind of, I think you guys kind of touched on it, but someone said data is a critical element for investigative reporting and intentional misrepresentation of data is a common thing to paint a picture that supports a narrative and people use mathematical jargon to you know confuse it so how would the panel advise on dealing with all this jargon and yes, misrepresentation think, of data yes um, we 
something new now uh, in this pandemic too is uh, they make a brilliant visualization with data and that looks always very impressive because if you see a visualization you uh, you, you feel you see the reality and um, uh, with modeling it was really so uh, you, you forget it's just just a, a perspective with the data we have at the moment uh, and of the data are quite poor and uh, but the, the visualization still looks very nice and uh, i think uh, the quality of the data is really important and even if you have few data put them into perspective put them into context if uh, just was uh, serena addressed with the icu beds if you say i don't know we have this occupancy what is the standard occupancy we we really have to to compare and to see if it's uh, all the fear all uh, the the worry we have uh, uh, how would the same how would we have how, how would we had look looked at these numbers one year ago, you know, when there was not about COVID and so on. And probably we would uh, understand them a little bit different. Uh, and I think journalists have, have the duty to, to address really this question, to put them into perspective, to, na to name the uncertainties. Uh, uh, the, the journalists are not here to give hope. They are here to uh, address questions in a critical way. And again, going back to the guide, I mean, we are aware that, I mean, data is complex and the question is, the, the person that asked the question, of course, it's right. Also, as Catherine just said, all these curves and graphics, right? But still, uh, the guide contains, uh, like, it's really like hand, hands-on, step-by-step. Mm -hmm. How do you break it down? How do you, what methodology can you use? It's, it's a process, of mm -hmm. course, but we really hope that journalists can find there some bits of uh, help for their work. Great. Um, Eunice, I don't think we have any more at the moment, do we? But jump in if I'm wrong. <laughs> I want to ask one of my own. Um, of course, a lot of this focuses on uh, Western Europe, uh, the United States, uh, in terms of the certainly the regulatory process as you know as, as described but of course if you're a journalist or somebody who's interested in investigating looking into it in other parts of the world um, in the guide you've got a uh, an appendix which shows regulatory agencies all over the world but could you maybe talk a little bit about how if you're sitting as a journalist as I say or as an in investigator in I don't know somewhere another country uh, a small country in in the global south or whatever um, what, what would you be looking at in terms of the regulatory process? How does it work? And what, as a journalist, would you be having to, having to, to monitor? You know, how does that, how can you do your work in those parts of the world better? Um, I think it's still important, uh, even if you're not in Europe and in the US, to have a look at what the MEA uh, in European Union and uh, the FDA are doing, because they are- The Food and, the, the food and Drug Administration. Yeah, drug yeah. Administration. Yeah, uh, because they are still leading agencies. Uh, they are supposed to work with high standards, uh, and very often the assessment work they will do. Uh, the other uh, regulatory agency, they, they have confidence they can take over the work who uh, they are doing. They, they still will assess the data, but they will not do the same deep work. So a lot of documents that you can. Uh, uh, grab uh, uh, as a, a journalist, I think, go to the major agency for the beginning, maybe in Africa, to the South Africa uh, regulatory agency, it's important, to, uh, as well as we underline in the guide, uh, they have some very interesting uh, possibility for the journalist to access to some documents and so on. I think uh, uh, still it's important to see, but after that, of course, every regulatory agency in every country is free to decide not to approve or to approve uh, despite uh, other recommendation of someone. But uh, the, the, B, the, the detailed assessment will be done in the big, uh, in the major um, agencies. And yes. also, uh, I mean, in the guide, we have like some specific chapters about this, uh, about the work of the regulators, especially of the US FDA and the EMA. Uh, consider also that these two agencies, they tend to publish quite a lot. Mm -hmm. 
So they have huge websites with a lot of super interesting material available because once you can read, for instance, the minutes, so the notes of an advisory committee, for instance, because they have all the time experts consulting the agencies. Well, there normally you see red flags because maybe one expert that was sitting in that board actually thought about something. Hey, but this is, mm -hmm. here there is something. So you can find hints and red flags. And of course, in the guide, we also speak quite at length about it, about unpublished data, how can you get access to unpublished data? How can you use the Freedom of Information Acts in your country, in other countries, to get more data? And then the more you go, of course, the more, the deeper you can dig. And you Great. can really find stories yes. in there, you know, about the missed opportunities, about the tensions you have during the meetings and so on. It's really, it's really interesting. And maybe just one last thing, also you find it in the guide, but we believe that actually the approval process, it's gold it's because there normally, I mean, now we are in this fast track uh, world is quite complicated as we have seen, but still when you are investigating a drug, for instance, go see what happened in the very beginning. What was submitted to the regulators? You find a lot of stuff and also many ideas for stories. Yes. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, we could talk a lot longer, but we're running out of time. It just gives me a, a chance to tell the audience that we're actually doing another webinar uh, related to the guide, to this new health guide, and it's called Behind the COVID-19 Vaccine Race. Um, it's a chance, again, to hear from Serena Tanari, but also she'll be joined by Dr. Rebecca Chandler, who's a, a vaccine safety expert. And this will take place on Thursday, the 3rd of December at 9 a.m. EST. But you can check our Twitter feed or our website if you didn't catch that. And I think um, my colleagues have put it in the chat box right now. So I'm, I just want to Basically, before we close, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this session. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'd like to thank my colleagues at GIJN um, and also Data Leads and our audience today, of course. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank our two speakers, Serena and Catherine, for a very interesting and, and inspiring session. And um, again, thank you to the audience for joining us. Hope to see you again and goodbye for now.